Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Spot on Weather Teleconnections discussion for the 18th of December 2020. My name is meteorologist Matthew Euler, and in the spirit of Christmas, I wanted to go ahead and share this image this evening, a nice image of Christmas lights in the background and uh, the Christmas tree and the ornament. And so I hope everybody's in the festive holiday spirit. We got a lot to talk about in tonight's Teleconnections discussion um, with some really interesting uh, implications here in the, uh, not only in the short term, but even out to the medium range and longer range. So let's get right to it. <clears throat> First thing I want to start with, I haven't shown this in the last, uh, well, it's been a little bit actually, uh, probably about five or six videos ago, five or six weeks ago. I showed this image on how to read the Madden Julian oscillation, the diagram, the forecast. And um, generally, this is a great explanation of how the Madden Julian oscillation, MJO, how the diagram looks. Again, it ranges in phases from one to eight. Um, and you can see the different numbers represent the different phases. So, for example, if you look at the upper right portion of the, of the text, uh, the red arrow pointing to the six, the number six, that would correlate to the phase of the MJO, indicating the approximate location of enhanced convection. Now, in this particular image, the dark green line shows 45 days uh, forecast for the MJO phase and the amplitude from the forecast ensemble mean. <clears throat> Keep in mind, again, that the inner circle, the smaller inner circle, represents a null phase, very minimal impacts if the uh, MJO is in that smaller inner circle, or is forecast to go into that smaller inner circle, that represents a null phase. Um, the black line in this particular MJO forecast uh, diagram shows 20 days of observed MJO <clears throat> phases and amplitude prior to initialization. And then the uh, light and medium gray shading represents ensemble the ensemble spread at one and two standard deviations. Now, the distance from that smaller inner circle from the origin, the center of the diagram represents the MJO amplitude. <clears throat> All right, and one other thing I want to point out about this is you notice, uh, for example, phases four and five correlate to the maritime continent and enhanced convection over the maritime continent. Phases six and seven favor convection uh, over the western Pacific Ocean. Uh, phases 8 and 1, convection over the Western Hemisphere and Africa. And then phases 2 and 3 is when we get the convection over the Indian Ocean. So I just wanted to, again, break down these MJO forecast diagram. Um, just kind of break it down so you can understand this better at home. All right, so in conjunction with the MJO phases, phases 1 through 8, I show this every week and just showing you where the enhanced convection or that rising air motion and thunderstorm development would be, um, whether it be phase one all the way to phase eight. Um, generally, phases one uh, and eight are closer to Africa. Phases two and three are in the Indian Ocean, as depicted here in our phase diagram I just explained. Uh, phases four and five, uh, four and five, they cor uh, correlate with the maritime continent. And then phases uh, six and seven, Six and seven uh, correspond to the Western Pacific, and then uh, phase eight. Phase eight is uh, the Western Hemisphere, and Africa is phase one. Uh, so this is a great um, example of the MJO, and this has a huge bearing. It's a huge teleconnection that really plays into our weather during the winter season across the United States. All right, so let's take a look at today. The MJO temperature composites on the left for the months of December, January, and February. As I mentioned every week, um, the blue shading in the diagram on the left shows uh, below normal temperatures, the orange shading above normal temperatures. Um, so again, if you want it cold and you're a winter lover, a winter weather lover in the east, you want phases eight, one, and two for the months of December, January, and February. For, if you like the milder weather, uh, a warmer winter, you want phases four, five, or six. So let's look at the diagram on the right. <clears throat> now, that happens to be our GFS ensemble forecast running out to New Year's Day, January 1st. 
the uh, this is the ensemble forecast. So the green line on the graphic on the right shows <clears throat> pretty much the forecast over the period out over the next two weeks, showing a um, null phase to the MJO. You notice again the green line. The forecast remains within that smaller inner circle at the center of the diagram. So with that case, we'd expect minimal impacts out through the first of January. <clears throat> so. Really, uh, we're in the null phase right now, and we're expected to remain so, according to the GFS Ensemble forecast. What about the GFS Operational MJO forecast? Um, that is represented by the um, aqua color line, or the light blue color line. And again, look at where the MJO is. It's in the inner circle. So again, GFS Operational out through the 1st of January, indicating a null phase with minimal impacts to the United States. Um, so we, we're not expecting much in the way of activity, um, a larger amplitude with the MJO in the upcoming two weeks as of tonight's latest model runs. And it's been like this for quite some time. For the La Nina update, again, uh, we're definitely in a La Nina situation right now. Uh, the graphic on the left showing uh, below normal water temperatures by the blue shading. Um, they're off of the west coast of South America, all the way over to the International Date Line. Um, you see the bluer shading. That's below normal water temperatures in the equatorial eastern Pacific, which typically occurs with La Nina. Now look at north, or just above, that blue shading area, the graphic on the left, the orange shadings. Those uh, colors indicate above normal water temperatures. So right now, there's been a lot of above normal water temperatures off the Pacific Northwest and uh, actually uh, in the vicinity of Hawaii and northeast of there. So the northeast Pacific's got above normal water temperatures. If you look at the graphic on the right, that is a chart, a graphic line of the actual um, water temperature anomalies departure from normal in the Nino 3.4 region, which is located in the eastern uh, equatorial Pacific Ocean. With that Nino 3.4 region, um, you can see how we dip down to greater than negative uh, greater than negative 1.5 degrees Celsius departures from normal in that Nino 3.4 region um, into uh, late October and then you'll notice how the temperatures warm slightly uh, by November up to about 1 degree Celsius below normal dip down a little bit through the later part of November but now the water temperature departures from normal are at 1.03 degrees Celsius so from the previous week, we've seen slight warming, not anything significant, but um, we're at 1.03 degrees Celsius below normal um, for the water temperature departures there in the Nino 3.4 region. That's warmed slightly from <clears throat> um, minus 1.08 Celsius last week. So not much of a change, but the direction we're heading, we're really borderline now between a weak and a moderate La Nina. Uh, the National Weather Service, or NOAA, classifies a weak La Nina with temperature departure anomalies between 0.5 and 0.9 degrees Celsius below normal. And so we're basically sitting around 1 degree Celsius below normal temperature departures. So we're, we're right there on the border. You know, you get to moderate territory at minus 1.0. So we're right there. And, uh, you know, this is an interesting trend. We've seen the slight warming from late November. That could have a huge bearing on the overall upper air atmospheric circulation as we progress through the winter. So let's get right into the forecast models for our major teleconnections. We're going to start off with the AO. And uh, with the AO, wow, what can I say about this? Um, I'll talk a little bit about it. The negative Arctic Oscillation, again, on the left. What happens with the uh, pressure features with the positive Arctic Oscillation on the right? But what can I say about Arctic Oscillation? It's been really impressive and that it's remained negative pretty much for the whole month of December to this point. And we're at the 18th of December. So, you know, it, it dropped off in early December and it's remained negative. Um, and that is just, if it's a negative Arctic Oscillation, um, you're setting up more of a um, larger dips in the jet stream, the polar front jet stream, um, occasional Arctic air outbreaks into the Midwest and Eastern U.S., you're getting more of a flow, uh, Hudson's Bay, polar vortex shifting into position, which can deliver Arctic chill with a negative AO. So it's, it's totally indicative 
of what we've been seeing really in below normal temperatures. Um, now, the positive AO on the right, you get more of a west to east jet stream setup and you get milder air across the United States as a whole. I mean, you look at the bottom right there, the, gra uh, the map of the U.S., and you got mild conditions from the west to the east coast. Uh, there's a little bit of cooler, wetter conditions up in the Pacific Northwest, but that's it. And we've been seeing a lot of troughing in the eastern U.S. for quite a bit of time now. So let's move on to the forecast and see where we're going from here. With the European deterministic AO forecast, um, if you look at the blue line, that shows where it's been. So if you go all the way back to the 9th of December, a uh, value of almost negative one on the AO, and then it dips down all the way here recently, um, just earlier this week, uh, down to negative three. And now you see the model run, the white circled areas, and how it kind of climbs a little bit to negative one, but then it drops right back down to just below negative two by the 23rd of December, and then it comes up to around neutral right around the 26th of December before again dropping back down negative. Um, so this is very much indicative. This is European deterministic. Now this isn't even the 12Z run. I looked at the 12Z run and this forecast is just off the chart negative. So again, this will deliver cold temperatures with this overall setup of, on the left there, the negative Arctic oscillation, more of a amplified jet stream pattern. What about the European EPS AO50 perturbed numbers? This forecast goes out to the 2nd of January. And if you look at that green line there, that's the ensemble average, the average of all the different um, members of this particular model run. And it has also remained negative, significantly negative, really around the 23rd, uh, 24th of December. The European EPS AO50 return members, out all the way to 1 February, shows a negative tendency of the AO. Um, through the 15th of January, and then transitioning to slightly positive with milder temperatures in middle January. Now, what I've noticed about the trends and the biases with this particular model, the European EPS AO50 perturb members, the 46-day forecast, is it tends to um, has a positive bias or tendency in the long range. And um, I don't know what the cause of that is, to be honest, but I've just noticed the trend. Now the GFS deterministic AO forecast, um, again pay attention to the white line and look how far negative this thing dips. Uh, beyond the 26th of December it's well below negative 4 on a value. And it's nowhere close, looking at the blue line or the forecast, the white dots, it's nowhere close to that zero line. It's remained negative throughout the whole month. You can see it dip down um, there early December on the left and it just remained negative throughout and it's forecast to continue to do so. And then the NCEP Jeff's V12 30 perturb members showing an average uh, remaining negative, the AO, the green line there, the average of all the members of the model remaining negative for the AO. So AO negative, moving on to the NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation Forecast. Now, with the NAO, when it goes negative, and you get the AO negative at the same time, uh, that favors cold air in the east and also favors a uh, closer storm track to the east coast. Now, we just saw this this was last weekend or this last week when a major nor'easter buried uh, anywhere from uh, northern Virginia all the way up into Massachusetts, you know, Connecticut, New York State, Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania, got buried with a major snowstorm, some places up to 40 inches. So you can get a closer, uh, more intense storm track with a negative NAO. So where is it going to go? First, let's look at the uh, positive phase on the left versus the negative phase on the right. See that negative NAO phase on the right? That black arrow represents the axis of the jet stream, the polar front jet stream. You get a big trough across the eastern U.S. along the east coast. You get more nor'easter development with a negative NAO. And then you get that blocking upstream into Greenland, upper level high pressure. Um, so let's take a look to see what's going on with that. <clears throat> okay, so we just had the big, huge nor'easter um, that buried parts of the northeast with uh, just unbelievable amounts of snow. And uh, look at the blue line. Is that a coincidence? We had a negative NAO. Um, the forecast, the white dotted lines there, that tends to go towards neutral on the European deterministic around the 21st of December. 
Then a little dip negative, then back positive, and then back down negative again after the 27th of December. So uh, this forecast model showing a lot of ups and downs of the NAL. Now I did look at the 12Z. What we're looking at is the 0Z. <clears throat> I did look at the 12Z and it's much more negative again. So we'll have to watch that trend. Uh, moving on to the European EPS, NAL 50 per term members. The green line is what I'm most interested in, the average of all, the, all of the members of the model. Showing a, uh, a negative tendency um, around the 23rd or the 24th of December, uh, rising above slightly positive for a bit, and then uh, going neutral pretty much from 27 December to 2 January for the NAO on this model. The uh, 50 per term member EPS NAO forecast out through early February showing mostly a neutral trend. If you notice, the green line kind of hangs out around where the center of the diagram around the zero value. And the GFS deterministic NAO forecast showing, um, wow, negative again. Wow, unbelievable. And now it's moving up towards neutral conditions around the 21st of December. But look at that big dip again in the forecast after the 26th of December. And then another dip uh, into the early part of January. So uh, negative NAOs tend to lead to high latitude blocking, uh, a more amplified jet stream, a lot of dips and a lot of ridges. Um, so again, that's going to result in a lot of colder air being transported from higher latitudes into the U.S. And then the NSEP Jeff's V12, 30 perturbed members. Um, the green, pay attention to the green line. Notice again, it's generally, uh, the NAO is generally right around neutral conditions through the 30th of December and then back into slightly negative territory beyond that in early January. Moving on to the Pacific North American forecast. This has been an intriguing teleconnection to watch over the last five days. Um, just showing you again the differences between positive on the left, lower left, and negative on the lower right, PNA. Um, generally with a positive PNA pattern, you get the upper level ridge and rising heights over the western U.S. into western Canada. Sometimes that ridge can amplify all the way up into Alaska. Um, for the negative PNA on the right, bottom right, uh, it's a completely different story. The uh, eastern U.S. typically is influenced more by an upper level ridge and above normal temperatures and higher heights, while the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast in general features a trough and much colder temperatures. Um, so let's take a look at the forecast. European deterministic for the PNA forecast. Um, generally showing um, neutral conditions right now, more zonal. This would indicate a more zonal west to east jet stream. But look at the climb uh, from 21 December all the way out through about the 29th of December. See the white dots there and how the forecast model is taking it positive up to a positive three value by around Christmas time. And I'll, I'll tell you what, Christmas is looking awfully cold in the eastern U.S. Um, and I'll get to that at the end of my brief. All right, and then moving on to the European EPS PNA, 50 per term members, pay attention to the green line, the average um, forecast of all the members of the model, showing again, look at the increase, the positive values between the 23rd and the 26th of December, then it comes down slightly to more neutral territory after that. And the European EPS, 50 per term members, 46 day forecast out to early February, look at the positive trend, the green line, look at that, 22 to 26 December, uh, we get that positive PNA, that stronger PNA that results in higher heights and a bigger ridge out west. And then it drops down below the zero line to negative territory from 1 January through 1 February. And then the GFS deterministic PNA forecast. Um, we were really up high there in early December, the upper left hand portion of this graphic. We crashed down to neutral conditions, but look at where we're going again. You know, we were at a positive four the first couple days of December. It was really cold. The trough was digging out in the east. We had a ridge in the west, warm and dry. And now look at that around the 25th of December, right? And just in time for Santa to come down uh, from the North Pole. Look at that. Oh, very positive PNA. That's going to result in a upper level ridge in the western U.S. and in western Canada and a major dip in the jet stream across the east and very cold air. And then finally, the NSEP Jeff's V12 PNA. Uh, 30 perturbed members. Oh, wow, look at that, the green line again. So all these models are in concurrence that we're seeing a, a climb or a rise to the positive side for the PNA between 22 and 26 December and then back down closer to neutral on this model. What about the Eastern Pacific Oscillation Forecast? The negative oscillation conditions on the left, what typically happens, the Arctic highs coming down. 
Um, you get high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska over low pressure closer to Hawaii in the East Pack. On the right, you see the positive EPO. Milder conditions across the uh, United States from west to east coast. All right, so EPO forecast, the European deterministic, showing a major rise of climb between 19 and 21 December, then a uh, dip down uh, closer to that neutral line, a little bit up and down there between 23 and 27 December. European EPS, 50 perturbed members. Again, that's a major climb, um, and then more of a neutral condition, looking at that green line. The European EPS, EPO 50 per term members, showing a more positive value throughout the period through early February. And then the GFS deterministic EPO forecast, showing a positive uh, there 20 to 21 December, back down to neutral 22 December to about uh, the 28th of December, then back positive again. And then finally, NCEP GFS V12, 30 per term members, showing a positive value there around the 20th of December, peaking up at positive 3 coming down closer to that zero line, more to neutral territory for the good majority of the period. Now, as far as the polar vortex update, looking at the left-hand graphic, that's our current analysis of the polar vortex. Uh, you'll see the white lines indicating the geopotential meters at 30 hectopascals or 30 millibars. Um, you notice the shape of the white lines, how they're more stretched on the left-hand graphic. So the polar vortex has been weakening over the last two to three weeks. Um, there are indications, as we are looking at some of the models earlier today, that we could see a stratospheric, a sudden stratospheric warming event in January. Um, the European has been showing this recently um, as a possible scenario. Uh, and then the, the graphic on the right shows the forecast on the 26th of December. You notice how the uh, vortex, <coughs> the white lines become more symmetrical in shape, circular. Uh, less stretching, uh, but then we have re-stretching uh, re out again by the end of December into early January. So the bottom line here is the polar vortex can do one of two things. It can either um, be displaced off the pole or it can be a complete split. And in either case, you can get different outcomes or scenarios, um, but the probability once the polar vortex weakens of uh, extremely arctic cold air moving into the lower 48 in the U.S., or even in Europe is very much possible. So we'll have to keep an eye on the polar vortex. Uh, that's, that's an important piece to look at in the winter season. So now here are my final thoughts for tonight's video. And you'll have to forgive me. Um, these allergies are getting me tonight a little bit. Um, it's ironic, it's December, and yet I'm fighting these allergies. Um, got a lot of draining going on in my throat. A lot of it that, I don't know if you ever had that tickle before in your throat um, from allergies, but I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of trying to make it through this video tonight. All right, so final thoughts. The Madden Julian oscillation is currently in the null phase through early January. You know, this is, I can't remember a winter, it's been a little bit, since uh, the MJO has been this inactive. Uh, we're not gonna expect much in the way of impact uh, from the MJO on the weather in the United States uh, over the next two weeks. Just minimal impact, let's go back to it. And again, I look for the forecast, and if, it's, if that line, the forecast, remains within the inner small circle, the graphic on the right, see the green line? That is a forecast out through 1 January, and that is not going outside that inner circle. All right, and neither is the GFS operational. Uh, I'd have to take a look at the European operational, and uh, it's very similar. So MGL, bottom line, not a big um, contributor to what we're going to expect in the United States for the next two weeks. The La Nina conditions, they're still there. They're existing across the equatorial eastern Pacific. We're looking at a minus 1.03 degrees Celsius uh, water temperature departure below normal in the Nino 3.4 region. Now, just by virtue of La Nina and looking at past cases, it generally leads to a drier and milder um, winter for the mid-Atlantic states. We'd expect milder temperatures in the eastern U.S. if La Nina really was the more influential force here. But again, as a reminder, water temperatures continue to creep up and get warmer. Uh, those anomalies, those cold anomalies are shrinking. And now we're right there on the border again between a weak versus a moderate La Nina. Uh, again, if this warming trend continues, we can expect less of an impact by La Nina on our temperatures for the U.S. this winter. I looked at the NOAA discussion 
um, for the extended outlooks today. And I noticed they mentioned about La Nina having an influence on the weather over the next 30 days. <clears throat> but, um, you know, it keeps weakening. I keep seeing these temperatures warming. So uh, I'm expecting less impacts if that trend continues. Moving on now to the models uh, indicating a negative trend in the AO through early January. And this would promote colder temperatures in the eastern United States. Um, we, we looked at it, <clears throat> you know, whether you look at the European model or the GFS model for the AO. I mean, this, <laughs> the whole month of December has been nothing but negative for the AO. European forecast plunging. And then you've got the, uh, even the ensemble prediction systems, you know, the European ensembles, negative. Um, possibly trending toward neutral. But then look at the GFS deterministic, completely negative again. Um, so, AL remaining negative throughout the next two weeks. What that will yield through early January is colder temperatures in the east. Models are also indicating a negative to neutral trend of the NAO through early January. Um, with a negative NAO, this would feature colder temperatures in a trough in the eastern U.S. with a more active east coast storm track. Now, if that NAO were to trend more neutral, uh, we could see more of a zonal west to east jet stream and less amplification, um, less thermal contrast, and uh, this, the baroclinic zone or the area where the uh, greatest thermal contrast would push back to the northwest if it goes neutral. And that's a big if. Models are also indicating a positive PNA through Christmas Day, 25 December, as favoring a trough in the eastern U.S. Now, and most of the models are in concurrence. I've looked at ensembles, I've looked at deterministic models, and all of them are indicating cold temperatures through late December for the eastern U.S. And let me tell you, that one, that Arctic front that blows through here on Christmas Eve, that one's going to pack a punch, folks. Um, we may be looking at highs in the 60s up the eastern seaboard prior to frontal passage on Christmas Eve morning. But once that Arctic front blows through, look out. It is going to drop quickly, the temperatures. And those winds are going to be very strong behind the Arctic frontal passage. Uh, models are indicating a positive trend in the EPO through late December, early January. And that will promote milder temperatures across the eastern U.S. All right, so if I look at the board here, uh, let, me, let me do the polar vortex and I'm going to go back. Models are indicating a weakening polar vortex through the 21st of December, through the winter solstice, and then re-strengthening over the North Pole, followed by, again, re-stretching and weakening. Now, that will lead to possible colder temperatures uh, moving into the eastern U.S. the latter part of December. Now, that looks like it's going to happen around Christmas Day. Uh, you know, I was looking at the model input, or I mean, model output, and uh, it looks extremely frigidly cold. Um, and the polar vortex may be sending a arctic lobe of air down due to its weakening. Um, so look at the board here. Before I get to the overall assessment, MJO, minimal impact on temperatures. It's sitting in the null phase. It's not amplified. Um, the La Nina conditions were on the weak, moderate strength category. So, you know, what was once perceived to possibly be in the forecast and the, the climate models, a strong La Nina this winter is not happening, folks. It's actually warming in that Nino 3.4 region. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a much weaker La Nina, I think, than most people were thinking, including myself. Uh, when I did the winter weather forecast, I was thinking stronger La Nina the way it was trending. And so we'll have to watch the trend of the water temperature departures. Do they get colder again? Or do they stay about where they're at? Or do they continue warming? Big impacts on our winter weather. And then the cold temps, negative AO, that's holding through early January. And then the NAO, I think the NAO is a big player as far as if you want a winter storm, multiple winter storms, the storm track to be along the uh, U.S. East Coast, uh, you want a negative NAO with the blocking upstream over into Greenland. And then that PNA, the month of December has pretty much featured the ridge out in the western U.S. and the trough in the east with a positive PNA. So, overall assessment, the upcoming forecast period through early January is going to feature major impacts. And I think the major two teleconnections between now and early January will be the negative AO and the positive PNA. 
because those two together combined is a constructive interference situation. Two teleconnections working towards the same outcome, not against each other, but together and resulting in a building heights in upper level ridge in the western U.S. and the western Canada and falling heights in a deep trough in the eastern U.S. A major Arctic blast is going to be on the way for Christmas this year due to that kind of teleconnection setup. Those two teleconnections, AO and PNA, working together. Now, the Mad Julian Oscillation continues to remain quite inactive through early January. So, you know, we may not see as much influence from the Pacific Ocean over the next two weeks. And if this trend continues with the MGO remaining very inactive, we may not see much of an influence at all from the Pacific over the winter months, um, including January and February. Of course, things can change. We're talking about the atmosphere, so things can change on short order. La Nina continues to weaken slightly, as I've mentioned, which is huge on the overall upper atmospheric configuration, the jet stream pattern for January and February. I would say all bets are off. <laughs> all bets are off with a weaker La Nina pattern. You just... I've looked at past um, weak La Ninas, and there's been some doozy snowstorms in the eastern U.S. during weak La Ninas. Uh, additionally, the NAO will be a major player between now and middle January. Like I said, if you want snow and if you want some winter weather in the eastern U.S., um, you want that NAO to go negative. So it's going to be interesting. If that NAO becomes more negative, we'll expect to see more frequent cyclones, uh, more frequent storm track moving um, from the Gulf of Mexico off the southeast coast. Um, if you have the negative NAO, you're going to get a closer, uh, more coastal storm track with greater significant impacts on uh, east coast cities. And then the polar vortex has been weakening over the past few weeks, and additional weakening is, weakening is likely. Um, and I'm generally getting towards late December, early January. And again, the European model, the last two runs, has indicated uh, <laughs> really a big uh, weakening of the polar vortex in a, what's called a sudden stratospheric warming event. Uh, when you get excessive warming in the stratosphere, you can result in a major weakening of the polar vortex, uh, and that can lead to either the split or, the, or displacement with just bone-chilling air moving into the U.S. <clears throat> All right. So based on the teleconnections forecast, as of today, the 18th of December, I'm expecting a colder than normal time period for the eastern U.S. over the next two weeks. Now, sure, there's going to be brief warm-ups. There is every winter. But they will not be long-lasting as in the previous two winters. The previous two winters, we saw warm dominate. Warm basically was just, you know, in control, really, across the eastern U.S. But based on these teleconnections right now, we expect mild air in between the cold shots. But they're not going to be long-lasting as the colder air reloads from Canada and dives back into the eastern U.S. Uh, with an amplified jet stream pattern. So get ready. If you really like winter weather, uh, I know I do. <laughs> it was really extremely discouraging the last two winters in the eastern U.S., uh, here in southeast Virginia especially. Uh, you know, last year around New Year's, it was like 75 degrees, I think, if I remember correctly. I've looked back at the records, and it just, there was no hope. There was no hope uh, until February for any kind of snow in the mid-Atlantic, really. Um, and even by that point, the ground was too warm here in southeast Virginia. It didn't even stick on the coast. So there is a lot of excitement in the air. Spot on weather. You know you can count on us um, to provide you with the latest updates. Follow us on uh, Facebook uh, as well as Twitter. Those are our main two social media feeds. We do the weekly newsletter. I try to get that out every Thursday, each week, once a week, the weekly newsletter. So please feel free to go to the Spot on Weather site and just do a Google search Spot on Weather Weebly. And the main page, the first page that comes up when you go into the Spot on Weather Weebly site, you'll see subscribe to our blog. If you subscribe to that blog, we'll be sure to add your email address to our distro list for the weekly newsletter. So that will go directly to your email inbox. Uh, our latest analysis, weekly analysis of what's to come. Um, again, I'm very excited. I hope everybody's having a great holiday season. You know, it's, it's unbelievable how, fa how fast this past week's gone. And now we're heading into, you know, Christmas is one week away. One week away, that's it. So I hope everybody's staying healthy with, you know, the coronavirus. Obviously, some good news with the vaccine. <clears throat> Hopefully that will uh, 
help eradicate uh, things over time with the virus. All right, that wraps things up. Thank you so much for subscribing to this channel, and uh, you know we'll keep you up to date. I'm really excited about the Christmas Eve, Christmas Day period for the Mid Atlantic uh, because. With such a strong Arctic front, it is possible that we could see rain change over to snow um, for early Christmas morning. And wow, not expecting a significant impact or storm, but things could change there. We get some moisture uh, to meet up with the major dip in the jet stream, the Arctic air, and we could see um, something interesting uh, right around Christmas or maybe shortly thereafter. So keep keep it tuned, um, keep looking at and watching for us and uh, spot on weather Facebook as well as Twitter. Thank you, everybody. I wish everybody good health and most you know most importantly happy holidays to all. Thanks again for subscribing to the channel and following us. God bless everybody. Have a great evening.